Welcome to the Modern Mythos Podcast, a show dedicated to the keepers and players of Call of Cthulhu and other investigative horror games. I'm John Hook. And I'm Seth Skorkowski, and together we'll discuss writing, game mastering, and player tips and how you can apply them to your table. And today, as we're entering the holiday season, we're actually just going to chat about things that, you know, John and I are just going to chat about what we're reading and watching and playing and uh, really just kind of talk about what else it is we're doing. Yeah, yeah. I thought this might be <laughs> a fun way to kind of close out the year, you know? I, I well, Actually, I see this as more of like letting people get to see what it is that you and I talk about in that, you know, when we schedule to what we're going to record, there's like an hour before and an hour after <laughs> where we talk about all this stuff. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, we have to like, okay, let's wrap this conversation up so we can do the podcast. And then like we do the podcast. It's like, okay, back to our chat about you know, what we're <laughs> reading. Yeah, or well, this I agree. So. And, and none of that is ever recorded. So it's not like we can archive that and put it out there. So here's, here's our attempt at doing that. So first up, uh, John, what what are you reading right now? Yeah, what, you know it's funny when I'm reading, I've kind of gotten into the habit of I'm reading multiple things simultaneously, but it's almost always each book is in a different format, uh, and I don't know oh, why. Okay. It just kind of I've kind of gotten to a place where I am able to keep track of each storyline and pick up right where I left off despite the despite where I left off or how long I've been gone as long as it's each one's in a different format I don't know it just it just sticks with me right so I typically have three going simultaneously and I'm contemplating starting a fourth one because I'm (laughs) insane Um, so right now I'm listening uh, on audiobook a classic, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, oh. I've never read it, but I loved the movies and everything so much. I was like, man, I need to actually read this. You know, have you read Dracula? I, uh, well, I, I I did it as an audio, and because it's in the public domain, there's a lot. And I remember, I think my first attempt, it was like it was a really bad narrator. I think I. Uh, it was through LibriVox, which does like free recordings uh, for, for the visually impaired. And mm-hmm. it's kind of, you get what you pay for. Some of their narrators are really good. Others aren't. And I didn't catch half of it uh, because the guy was, I don't know, trying to be dramatic or something. I don't know. And so I came back a couple years later, get like a really professionally produced one. And I enjoyed it a lot, but it was, it was really weird the second time because it's like, I vaguely remember half part of this I, I don't know i could never understand the guy i just kind of played while i worked but i i enjoyed dracula i was surprised that dracula was more like the francis ford coppola movie than i would have thought that it was uh because you know, you had the you know the big texan and and all of that yeah. when they were yeah yeah were that thing. Uh, i also love the fact that have you finished it yet i have not finished it i was going to say the the thing that surprised me the most because Based on my exposure to movies that have been made of the book, uh, and I'm primarily thinking about Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, and and I'm also thinking about there was a recent movie just called Demeter, which was only about the the sea voyage, you know, coming to uh, England. That section of the book is incredibly short, with not a lot of characters and everything in it. And I was like, huh, I was really expecting a lot more in because no. that's one of my favorite parts it is, is the Demeter chapter when I'm thinking about the movies and stuff. And, and I enjoyed the, uh, the recent uh, Demeter movie. And I realized that, you know, changes were made to make it more dramatic and everything, which was super entertaining. At least I assume there were changes made to make it more dramatic. I didn't just, I just didn't realize how many changes were made because it was just barely, just barely a footnote. It felt like in, uh, in the book itself. One of the things I did uh, like about that, which was uh, kind of gets brought up is, you know, yes, it's, it's this you know, old timey Victorian novel, but you know, at the time you had stuff like the, uh, the doctor was recording all of his stuff on the wax cylinders, which was like cutting edge 
technology and they're doing the blood transfusions, which was cutting edge uh, technology at that time. And it's like when they talk about Lovecraft where it's like, oh, it's this quaint 1920s. It's like, man, when he did it, that was, that was the most modern day uh, technology that was being it was being offered. So it was supposed to be like Dracula is happening right now. And like the most science that we have and all that this technology, it doesn't change the fact this is a, you know, this, this old world monster that's now you know feeding on the, on the people. Uh, one of the things I, I did enjoy about that one is Mina is like kind of ends up saving the day. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and that went instead of just being kind of a damsel in distress. Uh, Mina is kind of the one that like kind of pieces it all together. Well, you know, the, 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 the men are off doing whatever it is they do. She's like, Hey guys, I figured it out. And it's like, <laughs> like, but then every film version, they kind of like reduce her to, you know, a, a damsel in distress or um, something like that. Instead of actually being very involved and mm-hmm. critical to the, the whole process. Uh, one of the ones that I actually just reread, uh, and I go through it about every other year, uh, but the the woman who had recommended it to me originally had recently passed, so I kind of pulled it out a little early, is um, Dennis Wheatley's Devil Writes Out. And that is clearly based or inspired by Dracula because you've got the same archetype characters as our heroes. Like there's the uh, a very educated, older you know, gentleman that's kind of the leader of it all, kind of your uh, Van Helsing, and including the giant, you know, larger than life, rich Texan mm-hmm. among them. It's like very clearly the the same, you know, inspiration of, you know, like we're just going to take those characters and I'm going to file the names off of them and uh, put them in another role <laughs> in, uh, in the 1930s, uh, which is the cutting edge modern day now. And so I, I kind of found that interesting when I did do Dracula, that it's like, Oh wow, Dennis Wheatley really filed the serial numbers off these characters and just kept using them because that's their favorite thing. So uh, it, evidently, the, the Brits just love having a giant Texan <laughs> as their quartet of heroes. <laughs> that's their quintessential American. Oh, oh, and it's so clearly like this is how we picture Americans. He's big, and he's he's not that bright, but he's loyal, and he's just. <laughs> Rich and, and Texan. That's that's literally all we know about them. <laughs> Br- brave beyond sanity, you know. Brave beyond self uh, self protective sanity. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely fearless, but also at the same time kind of dim. <laughs> Quite. Uh, what are you reading? Very um, weird ping well, pong back and forth. Oh yeah, I I recently just finished uh, uh, Ben Aronovich's uh, ninth Rivers of London book. So you know, part of us I had heard about him, and then Kiasim recently did that game yeah. Rivers of London, and I, I knew nothing about it. And in August, I I picked up the uh, the audiobook because I do just about just about everything I do is audiobook. I picked up the first one, and it was good. And it was done too fast. Uh, I don't know. It says it's 10 hours, but it felt like a lot shorter than that. So then I picked up the second and then third and the fourth. So uh, I just finished the ninth with a couple of their, the short novellas, you know, like, like book 3.5, you know, kind of throw it there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the last one currently. So I, all of a sudden it's like, Oh, uh, so I, uh, today, uh, I started um, CJ Cherry's uh, Down Below Station, big uh, science fiction novel. Yeah, yeah, I, she's I, great. And I'm like, by just start, I mean, I'm like 20 minutes in. Uh, <laughs> guy, so I can't even tell you anything about it <laughs> other than I just started it today after going through my morning period where I actually did listen to the first Rivers of London book. I already did a re listen to it. Uh, Again, now that I've done, I'd say, okay, well, now that I know more about the world, let's go back and kind of you know, see see what it was, see what subtle things kind of really changed. Yeah, I the read one know of her fuzzy. I read one of her fuzzy books years, like I was in high school, uh, and I can't remember the title of it now. But I think it was. I'm, I'm hoping it was book one because uh, I know she did several fuzzies. Is is Down Below Station in that fuzzy universe? 
there it it is in that shared universe that she's been doing since the um uh is it dying sun or fading sun uh series she's doing since the late 70s it's all mm. the same universe evidently uh i've never i've never done her before so uh, it's one of those yeah like oh yeah let me let me try this like oh my god she's prolific <laughs> yeah <laughs> like well, I, this is a, there's a hole in my reading thing. I'm going to start plugging. So I just started that today. So I can't tell you anything about it other than I have started. Well, if you go to Half Price Books, she'll definitely have a shelf to herself. So oh, I'm 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 sure. I said there was there was a lot there. Yeah, there was a lot there. What else you got? That's your that's your audio book. What what have you got on your right. other formats? So uh, on Kindle, a, fr- a friend of mine recommended because he knows I love horror. He recommended The Hollow Kind by Andy Davidson, and uh, so I'm reading that on my Kindle. This is a so far it is a fantastic story, and I and I've got it on hold right now. I need to go back to it. But I am just absolutely loving it because it is being written or it's written in a uh, in a dual time period setting. So you have one is modern and then you have the other is maybe 60 to 70 years before that. Um, And. and it's really, really interesting to see, you know, the how the the setting is different, and and how that setting is because uh, it's a certain locale, uh, how it's being um, approached by by characters depending upon the time period. So, uh, in modern, a uh, a young woman, uh, a mom who's uh, escaping from a uh, an abusive relationship, uh, she has. Uh, inherited her grandfather's house way out in the middle of, you know, BFE in the, in the woods and stuff. And, uh, and it's, you know, haunted or something, you know, there's something awful going on or it happened there. And I'm still, you know, still learning and reading about what's, what was so bad out there. And so we're going to, we're going to see in first person what was so bad because the time period, you know, the, in the past is the grandfather when he was a uh, young man, you know, in his, you know, probably late twenties, newly married, you know, this, with this young bride who he, uh, he kind of stole her because this, this guy, he was a very forceful, even in his twenties, he was a very forceful young man. And it's, the book is set in like, I think it's set in Georgia, but he was, a northerner he was you know coming from the north like you know new england states and uh, came down with money and uh, and so he was buying up land and and this one guy was he was just kind of losing out to this young guy who's coming out of nowhere and they you know they ended up having a little bit of a of a truce because this northerner ends up marrying this guy's daughter. Right. And she, Mm. she did not want it. She didn't, she did not like the fact that her, that her dad basically sold her off to competition, you know, cause they were in forestry and stuff. And, uh, and he sold her off to competition as, as a bride so that they would have a, a mutual uniting our houses, united their houses. And so then that united their businesses. And, uh, and she was pretty put off that, uh, that, that happened. And so, yeah, something, all we know as far as, and I'm still fairly, you know, early in the book, I'm, I'm still in the first third, something awful happened years and years ago. She, you know, the, the bride, the, the, uh, disheartened and and disgruntled bride had something to do with something awful that happened uh and so yeah i think the the stain of whatever bad that happened back then that stain is still present in the modern day and uh we'll see how that plays out with this you know the granddaughter who like i said she's a she literally physically escaped 
from a abusive relationship, you know, told her 10 year old son that they're going on a camping trip. And so she basically just stole the son and they escaped. And she's just hoping that her husband, who she hopes will through legal actions, become her ex-husband. She's hoping that her husband won't find her, which I'm assuming he will. Right. And, and so now we'll see what happens then, but so, okay. Yeah. The hollow kind um, should it's so far playing out to be pretty cool. I like it a lot. The uh, only other one is I also at at some conversation I got into recently, and I actually picked up again um, Ben Riggs's "Slaying the Dragon," and I I gave that one a second listen to because there's so much information in it that kind of comes at you so fast that I was like, let me just absorb this, and that's the the one of basically the downfall of TSR. Uh, it's uh, the history of the gaming industry. Oh, okay. And okay. It, it, the first time I did it, I actually, it was a perfect pairing because I did um, John Peterson's Game Wizards first. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just over Gygax and Arneson. And it ends as Gygax gets, gets ousted uh, from TSR. And then I followed that immediately with Ben Riggs is Slaying the Dragon. And that one it kind of hurries through the Gygax years and really then focuses on the, uh, on the Williams years after that, where you basically, you finish off first edition, do second edition, how it, how bad it, 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 it was. And then eventually getting sold off to, to Watsy. And it is, it's a fascinating book because at the time during the nineties, you know, I'd consider TSR like on top of the world, uh, we had like a billion settings and all these splat books. So there's just so much of it. And they were so hemorrhaging money and they were treating their staff so badly that they were, they were leaving and because they didn't feel that artists really meant anything. So yeah, you know, like they, you know, had, a um, you know, oh, oh, it's like Bob Salvatore comes in. He, he, he brings them drizzed. And they kind of treat like we don't really need this guy, you know. It's like it, the property is what's valuable, and they they weren't paying him anything really. And then you know Bob, Bob Salvatore leaves, and they're kind of like, well, that's weird. It's like this guy was giving you like all this all this money, these these best sellers, and, and of course the same thing with um, you know uh, was it Weiss and Hickman. Uh, and all that same, same thing where it's like, well, we don't really need a, the, the, the authors, the artists don't really matter. Um, and then, so it's, it's a fascinating book, but it is it completely changed to, you know, what I thought was like this great time for them and their, their mismanagement. They wouldn't tell the people how, how they were sales numbers were. So none of the, the Ravenloft guys knew how their books were selling and other dark sun guys knew how their books were selling. Um, and in, in any of that, so they thought they were selling a lot and they weren't, nobody knew that they weren't selling. And the, uh, like there was one dark sun series of flip book adventures where you could like kind of, they're like spiral bound, I guess. And you could lay them out and beautiful art. TSR lost a dollar for everyone that sold like their, their management was so bad. They hadn't priced their stuff correctly. It, it, it is amazing how, wow. how yeah. awful I need to listen to that. that then. And, and uh, so I, I really enjoy RPG history books like, um, you know, Designers and Dragons and whatnot. But instead of being focused on a lot of games, that one's very, it's only focused on TSR. And he gets, he interviews everybody it, except for Williams. She wouldn't, she wouldn't talk to him for an interview, uh, which he kind of mentions a few times. Like, unfortunately, we, we don't know like her side of this story because he's actually really good about uh, being pretty neutral and uh-huh. but he he managed to get their sales numbers, which a lot of people didn't have, because then he would go back and talk to them. But I like to talk to Jim Louder and all that, because you know Jim was there, and we talked to him on our show. Yeah, and Jim's it was great. A f- fascinating book of like just the disaster of uh, wow, you know, just how bad TSR was. Like they couldn't afford to pay their printer anymore, so they sold their building to their printer. So their printer was now their landlord. Oh and they also God. entered an exclusive deal with their printer that they couldn't use another one. But then 
the printer refused to print anything until they got paid because they still owed so much money, but they couldn't print anything to get money to pay the printer. And it was just, you had departments that were making books, like ma- making whatever it was, and they put it in a bag to go to the printer, but they didn't have anywhere to give it. So they just put them in this room. This room was just accumulating bags of, of totally finished, ready to go to the printer product. And, but they couldn't send them anywhere. Oh, so wow. as, when, um, when Watsi eventually bought them, like there was like just a room of ready-made stuff uh, that it, it kind of goes over just kind of quickly the, the whole process of how that sale went and everything after, but, Oh, Oh my God, man. You, it's, oh, I got it's it. Cause I, I did listen to game wizards. Uh, that was a great audio book. Uh, just a great book. I mean, John Peterson does an amazing job. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to pick up Slaying the Dragon, Ben Riggs. Okay. And he doesn't really repeat any of the stuff that uh, the Game Wizards went into when it's over the, the guy X Arnest in the years. Like I said, he kind of hurries through it very quickly. Uh, so it's not like you're listening to the exact same thing a second uh-huh. time. Um, it's, just, it's just very quick. Just let's let's get on to when it got interesting. Uh oh after so it'll talk about some of the sales how bad it was this is what caused the buyout and then it, it, well, everything that happened after that which was just wow wow all right yeah that's awesome uh so um i am reading a paperback book right now um a trade paperback so it's the you know larger size and uh it's a classic uh, i i've never read it before i am legend by Richard Matheson. Uh, this is actually a book that a friend of mine gave to me. He let me borrow it. So I'm trying to burn through this so I can uh, return it to him. But uh, it's fantastic. I had not read uh, I Am Legend. And, you know, there are so many different movies, you know. There's oh, yeah. the like, I Am yeah. Legend, Excellent. Omega Man. I mean, you know, all kinds of adaptations. Last, last Man on Earth. So I like yep. Yeah, Vincent Price, Charlton Heston, and Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> and none of them are that accurate, you know, that faithful to the uh, to the book. I like how in the book, uh, a former coworker of of the uh, of the main character, um, uh, Richard, oh, I can't. I'm, blanking on his na- last name right now but uh will smith <laughs> will smith but uh the the character's former co-worker who was uh, his his ride right the, the author just assumed of course i forgot when it was written but the author just assumed that that uh people who worked in the same office they would uh coordinate and co and 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 ride share with each other right so you know one morning he talks about you know the last normal morning of his life you know having breakfast with his wife and drinking coffee and then there's a beep beep outside and it's like oh there's you know Brian and he's here to pick me up or Ben I think is his name Ben and he's here to pick me up and and take me to work and so the two of them drive to to the office together right instead of you know driving yourself to the office well his coworker who's a vampire comes out there and is constantly calling out to him every night. Come out here, come out, Richard, you know, we want to eat you. And, uh, it's a, it's a really, really interesting book. Uh, uh, I'm almost done. It's, it's a, it's really a novella and it's broken up into four parts. So I'm in the fourth part now, but, uh, it's really, really cool because he does all this research and, they take an angle where it's uh, uh, the vampirism is, is uh, a disease, you know, it's a germ. And, uh, and he's got this theory that some of the vampires are dead creatures who are reanimated by this virus, this germ. And so they're undead monsters, but some people are actually still alive. They, their physical bodies haven't died, but they still have this germ. And, and they are still vampires, but I guess they're not undead. I don't know. I think hopefully there'll be a resolution to that shortly. But there's a, there's been an interesting twist where we're seeing that uh, the living vampires are uh, starting to mutate. Things are things are happening to them, and uh, and they say that they're going to take over the earth, and it will be a new earth. 
and all this. And he's like, oh boy. So he's going to try and figure out a cure, but we'll see how, what happens. I'm, <laughs> I'm very interested on, on how this ends now. Okay. I, that, that is on my list of classics. I need to get around to. So I, uh, it's super I, cool. I need to get down. Uh, and then, you know, as we're recording this, uh, yesterday was my birthday, and so I just got a, a, a book as a gift, which is called uh, Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. And uh, so this might be the fourth type of book I add to my repertoire, where this one's a hardcover. So maybe I'll have a paperback oh. and a hardcover, as well as a Kindle and an audiobook, right? I don't know why. It makes sense for <laughs> for me. It mentally makes sense if I've got different formats, right, for each book. Uh, and it's funny because the paperback I'm reading is one, of, like I said, it's called a trade paperback, so it's the larger size. Where the mass market paperback is what you normally think of. Of so maybe, yeah. I, maybe I add mass market in, in as well. But uh, this uh, fourth wing, just reading the dust jacket on this, uh, seems pretty cool. It's a fantasy you know, D and D style universe with dragon riders, but the main character, his dragon apparently is dead or maybe her dragon. I'm not real sure on the gender of the uh, main character, but uh, this dragon rider, their dragon is dead and he's going through an existential crisis of uh, like, what good is a dragon rider? If your dragon is dead, do you still go on? And so, that I think is the premise of this book on what do you do? You know? Oh. So I don't know. we'll see what happens Talk about dragon riders without a dragon. Oh, okay. I'm going to go on a limb and say that he's going to end up having to go through some kind of, of, uh, you know, Hercules series of tests in order to acquire a new dragon. <laughs> so that, probably with a montage, it'll probably be the <laughs> biggest baddest dragon <laughs> and uh it will be played by uh sylvester sloan uh in the movie so oh yeah he'll, he'll be voicing the cgi dragon <laughs> <laughs> that's right i can't wait to hear how terribly wrong we are uh well so you got your your your, your four formats that you're, you're currently reading what are you, you are you watching anything when you're not nose deep at a kindle or, or, or a book uh, I am probably way too deep in a lot of shows, but the only ones that I could start to think of, like um, I enjoy upload on Amazon prime. Have you seen this? Uh, my, my wife has been watching it. Uh, so I've seen bits of it periodically, but I'm not enough to like really follow the plot of that. She occasionally gives me like kind of the crash course of like what else happens. So, right. Right. Uh, yeah, but it's. I that's, like the, the, that's the one where you you've downloaded your personality into a uh, uh, after you've died. The yes, yeah. So there's hey, it's your it's your digital afterlife, you know, and uh, and if you uh, if you know your death is imminent, uh, you can sign over your your uh, mental rights or whatever, and they will upload you into the computer. And it's really kind of cool. The uh, the main character. This is season two. It just season two just got uh, released, or two or three. I think it's maybe no, maybe it's season three. But um, but yeah, the main character we learn was uh, murdered, but in such a way that it it looked like an accident, and now he's in the process of uh, trying to solve his murder and exposes murderers and uh, and then try and you know be a hero and do something good for the people okay so it's, it's instead of a, it's fun uh, says solving my murder as a ghost it's i'm solving my murder from the uh, this this digital good right. place right? right right okay right. and and uh yeah it's uh it's interesting because it's it's a comedy so it's got a lot of you know humorous things in it but it also is this like murder mystery thing i don't know it's it walks a fine balance between the comedy and the drama you know for the murder mystery thing i like it as far as uh you know murder ones uh, how's this for a segue uh, we actually just finished uh season three of only murders in the building on hulu have you have you watched this show i haven't because i don't have hulu oh my god it is 
Um, so it's it, it's Steve Martin, uh, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez, which mm-hmm. is a, a weird uh, thing. But Steve Martin, as you know, he he's he's written mysteries and whatnot, and and I knew that going in. Uh, it it is it's basically you've got three people that live in a very nice uh, Manhattan apartment building that are all addicted to true crime podcasts. And there is a murder in their building and they decide to make a podcast <laughs> about them solving it. And it, it is somehow after the first season, you're like, okay, there's no way this can go on because they solved it. Uh, there's, you know, it ends with another murder in the building. And then there's another, <laughs> and the, the, uh, it is, it is wonderful. It is, uh, by the third season, though, you can tell that they've gotten enough clout, won enough awards, and got enough budget that you know they're they're pulling in bigger and bigger stars oh, nice. to uh, to be their suspects and victims. And the uh, it's it's actually just very very delightful uh, to watch. So uh, only murders in the building. I have I, I love that show, so I I recommend it a lot. But it is very zany, but well done. I had heard that there's a lot of big name guest stars for that. And that strikes me as the same fad and, 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 and enthusiasm that the uh, Adam West Batman had, because back in the day, you know, the, that Batman show was so popular that I had heard, you know, that the reason why there were so many big names, you know, there were the villains, you know, is uh, everyone wanted to be a villain. You know, everyone wanted to guest star and be a villain on Batman. And it seems like, you know, that same kind of thing is now happening for uh, uh, only murder in the building. And and some of them, they, you know, the actors are to, uh, playing, uh, you know, themselves and others, they're, they're playing characters. So like this one had like, you know, Meryl Streep was in it and Paul Rudd were in it. But then um, Matthew Broderick came in as a, version of Matthew Broderick. It was just insufferable uh, because they're putting out a, a Hollywood play. And, you know, eventually like he has to call Mel Brooks for advice on how to deal with Matthew Broderick. So that you know, Mel Brooks shows up in it for a quick moment. It's like, you didn't tell him you were going to let him like be able to like interpret his character over one. Like, it's like, Oh God, you're screwed. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's a bizarre show. It's, but it's, it's, it's been delightful. So that's my, uh, my murder fix, which is now over, and I have to wait a year. Uh, <sighs> hopefully, they'll give me a fourth season. But oh, that's they, awesome. they they still ended it with the new murder. That'll be the next season. At are the, you the sure they're not living in a hospice? Is, um, I also desperately want a map of this building layout because it is so enormous. And then once you start adding the secret passages and stuff, like I really, I really want a map of this this old New York high rise apartment building just you know, for, for gaming reasons. And also for like, how is this building possible? <laughs> this building was brought to you by Zool. Uh, yes. <laughs> and it has a high body count. That is funny. Yeah. Some of my, uh, uh, you know, go-to shows are, you know, the new iterations of star Trek. And, uh, so right now, Star Trek is on, you know, all the Star Treks are on hiatus right now. So um, to fill that gap, uh, I'm so happy that uh, the, is this the third season? I think this is the third season. Let's see, 70s, 80s, 90s. Oh, maybe it's the fourth season of uh, For All Mankind on Apple Plus is, is ju- just restarted. So we're going to get several of these. Is that the one with Pike? Well, no, no, no. Uh, uh, the Star Treks are on hiatus. So Captain Pike is on uh, Strange New Worlds. This is ah. For All Mankind. It's on Apple Plus. And this is uh, a show by Ronald Moore, Ronald D. Moore, who was a producer, showrunner, writer for Star Trek Next Generation. He was on also for, uh, I believe, Star Trek uh, Enterprise. And... Uh, For All Mankind is an alternate history where the Russians were the first to land on the moon and plant the flag oh. on the moon. And so what I absolutely love is that season one of For All Mankind is 1970s 
and they they did a, an amazing job in recreating the 70s but it's 1970s nasa program and the what if what would have happened you know at nasa if the russians were first to the moon if they won the uh, the space race and uh, and it was really kind of cool because it was like you know Nixon is in office, uh, Watergate is is uh, it doesn't happen. You know I think Watergate happened, but the investigation and the conviction didn't happen. And uh, so Nixon you know really wanted to promote the uh, space program, and so he has uh, Nixon's women. You know as they as they introduce a female astronaut training program so we end up having you know women going to the moon because the russians also had the first woman on the moon and so there was this all all this stuff where the the americans were constantly losing the space race and uh, and just how we really kicked it into high gear to try and get into it so season one is in the 1970s and it was awesome season two is the 1980s Season three was the 1990s, and so this is season four now because season four just started, and it is uh, the early 2000s. So it's you know it's like 2003, 2004, something like that. But by season three, mankind is on Mars. Like we have wow. we have uh, sent a manned mission to Mars. So this whole alternate history thing. It has been fantastic. It is so good. And what's really neat is they'll have uh, little montage clips of, you know, uh, news events, you know, whether it's TV news reportings or newspaper reportings or pop culture things going on, you know, all this kind of stuff as little montage clips whenever they're uh, uh, advancing time or or they're starting a new season and, uh, and you just, you see certain things and, and you're like, Oh, that's funny. They alternate, you know, they did that as a different history thing. And so it's, it's really super, super entertaining, uh, for all mankind. It's has some of the best special effects and everything. And what I love is also anytime they're, they're like having a sequence in space, you know, there's a space walk or something like that. It is always dead silent right there's there's just no Ah. sound whatsoever you don't have you know rocket thrusters or you know anything like that you know it's always just absolute dead silence uh and it's it just plays really really well i uh well you brought up ronald moore uh he the other thing he did was uh uh, battlestar galactica and i have actually on a, a rewatch of, of that, uh, we started playing uh, Traveler earlier this year, and of course, you know what I do is uh, I then try to adjust some good sci-fi. And I, uh, I went ahead and I, uh, I own it all on disc, but because I was doing it on a on a uh, stationary bike, I just but I start streaming it and buy it again uh, through another format of uh, through Amazon. So I'm, but going through that, I'm currently on the final season of uh, Battlestar and I forgot just how damn good that show uh, was. Or, yeah, there, there are certain, certain parts that you're like, kind of roll your eyes at, but I God, I really love that show. Uh, one of the big reasons is every character in it, you uh, with the exception of Adama, if you, if you start off loving them, you'll usually end up hating them at what point if you start off hating them as like, Oh, they're just the worst. You're absolutely in love with them by the end, such as the, the exo tie, you know, at the very beginning, he is just insufferable. Oh, and awful. Yeah. And I think around the time that he is leading the resistance on the planet, and you're like, man, this guy is hardcore. I love him. And it just, and they're, they're very broken. The president, you go through lots of periods where you just can't stand her. And then you love her. And they, don't like her, then you really love her. And, uh, but then you've got Edward James almost as Adama, who's like kind of like your, uh, kind of stationary. You, you, you pretty much like him the whole, whole yeah. way through. Um, I, I, I will again, watch that last episode that was horrible. And then I will strike it from my memory as is my tradition, <laughs> uh, when, when I get to it. Cause, uh, that was, 
that was uh, that's going to be rough, but it's 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 coming up on me. Um, but I have um, I've just been enjoying it. I, I used to love the old show when I was a kid, and I tried to rewatch it as an adult, and it uh, <clears throat> didn't hold up. It wasn't as awesome as I remember it being when I was like seven. Mm-hmm. So I, but yeah, you got dog fights, spaceships, all that stuff. So it's just it's yeah. just delightful. Yeah, I do love the uh, the remake of Battlestar Galactica. I I love the episode. Uh, I think it's in like season three when uh, uh, I think it's New Caprica or something, and it's like almost a, like a prison planet. You know, there's a bunch of people that mm-hmm. were taken prisoner, and uh, the Cylons are the are the guards and everything. You know, they're being held as political prisoners or whatever, and Adama brings the battle star in. They jump into the atmosphere and just begin oh, yeah. falling. Right, it is just falling to the to the planet. You know, it doesn't have Star Trek technology or whatever. Where it's just going to like hold its orbit or something in the atmosphere. This thing's falling like a stone, and they are doing what they can to launch Vipers as fast as they can get them out of the bays and then, and then jump again before they crash onto the planet. And then the Vipers are suddenly there because they got past the blockade that way. Right. There was a bunch of base stars around the, around the planet. They, uh, they jump in, release all the Vipers. And then that way the, the, uh, the prisoners were able to escape the, uh, the prison and everything. And I was just like, Oh my God. I just, I remember watching that oh. when it aired live and I was just stunned. I loved it. Oh no. Cause like the, the ship has got the, the fire cause it's doing a reentry. So the, the vipers and they come out, the tubes have to like shoot through the wall of fire. Yep. That's surrounding through that. The, yeah. That falling. fire, the reentry fire. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, so I, I'm enjoying it, and I can kind of kind of gloss past the parts that weren't that good. Like I still am not sure why all along the Watchtower was chosen as the the magic song for that. Like, but I can gloss past it and just keep enjoying it. But <laughs> that's awesome. It just seems so random that <laughs> they start singing all along the Watchtower. They're like, hey, that's a good song, but wow, wow okay, that's here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was this that is was happening. That was a little weird. I'm also loving the new updated version of Quantum Leap. Have you been watching this on NBC? No. It's, no, there's a there's a new Quantum Leap? There's a new Quantum Leap and I think it's great. Season 2 just started. Uh and it's great. It is so good. I'm I'm really enjoying it. Where is this? Uh, it's on regular regular TV NBC. Um, I think it oh. airs on Wednesdays. Oh, I haven't, I haven't had regular TV in God knows how long. Well, I'm sure you'll <laughs> be able to find it somehow, TV somewhere. <laughs> so, so is is like is like a total reboot of it? Are they doing it as kind of like a a, a sequel of sorts? It's a What's... continuation. It's a sequel. So okay. Um. So yeah, they and I. I was so hoping that. That uh, uh, <laughs> I forgot his name. Who was uh, who was Sam Beckett, the uh, the actor, the former Star Trek captain? That yeah, one? Dean Stockwell yeah. and uh, somebody uh, Bakula. Yes, yeah, Scott, Scott Bakula. I was yeah, so was... hoping because uh, you know so far Scott Bakula has not had a guest shot in you know in the show because I was so hoping that they would like resolve that one hanging Chad, you know, from the original series that, you know, you know, Dr. Sam Beckett never left home. Well, I was hoping they would finally bring him home. Uh, but so far that hasn't hey, he happened. Said he never does. Um, and well, uh, yeah, I mean, he, they need to close that loop, you know, but uh, because they've done other things like they are there, they talk about how Sam Beckett is, is like lost to time. And they, uh, uh, you know, in the final episode of the original series, in Sam's final leap that was aired on TV, he changed the the life of Al, you know, his 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 best friend, right? Played by Dean Stockwell. Yeah. So that instead of having a life 
of multiple marriages, you know, because that was always the running joke. You know, oh, that was with my second wife or that was with my fourth wife. Right. And, yeah. and it was always his first wife, the one that kind of, you know, got away because they married. But then I couldn't remember if she got disillusioned with the marriage or maybe she died or something. And then he, and then he ended up having all these different marriages. Well, oh, I, that's that's what it was. He the character Al marries this woman and then during the Vietnam War, Al got captured. The woman, because there was no communication and, uh, you know, the the Department of Defense, I think, also believed that Al had been, that he had died in Vietnam. The, the first wife, you know, had the paperwork and everything and they had a funeral, you know, for Al. And so you know, that first marriage dissolved and then she remarried and she basically, that's how she got away. Right. She ended up moving on with her life. Well, in the, in the leap, Sam comes back and he, he gives her hope and confidence that Al's alive and he is coming home. And so he changes history. She stays with him and Al only has one wife. Well, they respect that. And they, 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 they take that forward into the new show. So Al has passed away since the actor, you know, Dean Stockwell passed away, but they have his first wife, his only wife, you know, she was in the show in season one for a little while. Their daughter who, uh, we learned through the process, you know, she was kicked out of the, uh, of the quantum leak program when they were trying to restart it. So she was kind of like a dark agent in season one, which was super cool. They even had the prop that uh, uh, Dean Stockwell used as his little, little communicator to, to Ziggy when he would be talking to, uh, to, to, uh, to Sam, you know, during his leaps, that prop was on the show, but now they have a new one. That's a little more, you know, believable (laughs) sci-fi you know not as cheesy doesn't look like cotton candy or or, you know candy cubes or whatever yeah it had had kind of a a, a led rubik's cube sort of it did yeah yeah, yeah. something to it yeah Um, oh yeah cool it's it's, it's, i'm liking it a lot and the uh the other big one which we just started was uh was 30 coins which you and i have talked about which we both loved season one they've uh started doing season two and I looked forward to it so much. The first episode was actually pretty disappointing. Uh, have you have you started it yet? I started season, or I started and I watched episode one of season two. And uh, and you're right, it was a terribly disappointing show. And I haven't gone back to watch any of the other episodes of season two, but I heard that I should. Yes, uh, but, but basically, because the, the first episode, they're mostly kind of piecing together what happened after the you know, the blowback after the finale of season one, and it it kind of feels directionless. They introduce some sort of uh, YouTuber horror site girl that's going to the city, uh, and she is of some indeterminate age. She's either somewhere between twenty five and fifty. I have not been able to figure out how old this person is, <laughs> and. Uh, so like we, we watched it, we're like, uh, well, we'll, 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 we'll give it a little go. And then we waited a few weeks and then we sat down, uh, right when episode four released. So three weeks later and just plowed through them straight because it was like, oh, here it is. Here's that show that I loved. We, so once you get through the first episode, it's, uh, it picks up, uh, very much. And the, the third one was, uh, probably my favorite as far as twisting in your seat, uncomfortable at what is going on of uh, just like, Oh God, Oh God. It's just, so it is, um, it's, it, it's back. So I enjoyed that. I shall do. I'm going to, I'm going to dive back in. It's on my list. I need to, uh, something else that's on my list that I want to start because it's brand new. And I think there's only two episodes out so far is uh, monarch. Legacy of Monsters on Apple Plus. It's a Godzilla show. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Like there's there's this new show, and then I think completely unrelated is a Godzilla movie coming out 
uh, called Godzilla Minus One, which I think is from the same studio that did Shin Godzilla. But so Shin, Go- Shin Godzilla to me was like the most amazing thing. I was like, I don't know if you guys can top that. I think, <laughs> dude, uh, have you seen the trailer for Minus One? I have. I have not. I, I've, I've heard it's like a period piece. Like it's like Second World War, post Second World War, or something. But that's it might be. I can't tell. I uh, but I, I just Shin Godzilla to me was like just the perfect kind of remake of, yeah. of the whole uh, thing because it, it it was just it's just good. That thing was it's, terrifying. It's so good. It was so <laughs> awesome. And my son and I love it. We've got it on video downstairs. Now with this uh, new video, the new trailer for Minus One, um, you know, Godzilla is being an absolute monster. You know, he's not some kind of, you know, um, giant superhero for for uh, uh, the Pacific Islands, right? Um, he's a monster, and uh, and as I'm watching the trailer, I keep thinking because you're seeing him be so destructive. I keep thinking to myself, I wonder if this version will have the atomic breath. And as soon as I thought that, they started the sequence of showing that in the trailer, and so. You know how Godzilla has those like dual row of spines down his back and they're all, they're, they almost look like maple leaves, you know, how, how they got multi yeah. points and everything. So in this new one, as he's powering up and you're seeing like the blue electric energy, like building in his body, it's almost building from the tail up as it's like, coursing up his body going to his head and as the energy is coursing up his spine those multi-pronged spines on his back uh, they jut outward like like they pop out as they're like getting into the uh more powerful position or something as if they're as if they're recessed into his body and then as he powers up they just like jut out and so these things are like jutting one by one up his spine turning blue and you're like what in the hell is going on and it's just like it just powers up and then he's like you know in full you know powered up mode and i'm just like this is going to be the baddest thing ever. Oh my God. I, so, I, it's, it's yeah. just, if Toho's doing it. Uh, and if they're, if they're still sticking to like, we want to make this, uh, this serious, uh, because you know, for a while, like the, the, you know, the whole thing got really cheesy. And then you had the, the, the American ones, uh, which, you know, we're, we're terrible, but then, yeah, the should Godzilla kind of came out and just kind of laid the law down at, uh, changed him to make hit make it where you don't exact you don't know what he's going to do and that was you know some people didn't like the changes but i liked it because i had no idea what that thing was about to do the the whole time uh, like when yeah, it came out it's it was a salad awesome. and i'm like what is this <laughs> just, yeah just, all the different was, life stages and everything oh my god and then so yeah it, this this yeah, monarch it, though monarch legacy of monsters it's totally different. It's a different, you know, it's, it's not related to the movies and, uh, and I'm not sure how much of the monsters, you know, will there be more than just Godzilla? You know, will it be a whole host of Kaiju? I don't know, but it should be really cool. And so I'm, you know, between for uh-huh. all mankind and Monarch Apple plus is, is totally kicking it right uh-huh. now. Oh, well, it's like one of the few streaming services I haven't had, so I might have to check that one out. I um, and right now the only other one is we just started season two of um, Invincible. Oh yeah, on, on Amazon. Have you seen? Have you watched that? I I was I was really late to this. I think we 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 watched season oh, one for so the very good. first time like like a month and a half ago at. Uh, so like I, I knew nothing, it, 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 uh, so so I've 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 enjoyed it, and uh, I like I think they've only got like just one or two episodes. There's not much out so far. Yeah, three so episodes I'm, of season two. So I am uh, I'm enjoying that. 
but then as far as films go, the only like recent film that I've seen is um, the the Poirot movie. I finally saw Haunting in Venice, uh, the Agatha Christie Poirot period piece. I murder need mystery. To see Did that you get to see that? Yeah, I really enjoyed the others, and I want to see this one too. I, didn't didn't like it that much, uh, oh, wow. and I and I'm a sucker for Venice period pieces. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it part of it part of what it was because you know it's not that there wasn't any supernatural. I knew that the moment that I knew this was a Poirot movie. Yeah, yeah. But at the end of the trailer, when, when he steps in, I was like, oh my god, this is great because it's not supernatural at all. It, it I can't exactly tell you what was wrong with it, other than the fact that it just it just didn't leave me that satisfied. A lot of it kind of felt like they cheaped out except, but the, the sets costume acting was all wonderful. It just didn't, it, I don't know. It, it ended up kind of being a forgettable movie. Mm. It, uh, and it didn't give me that sense. Like, you know, when we saw Orient express, like it would just have those amazing shots. Death of the Nile would have that. It was like, you know, the, the, the scenery and, the, that sense of grandiose. And it didn't have that. It had some beautiful shots of Venice beginning until they get to the house, but it it just didn't give me that same feeling uh that the others did. It it felt it felt more like it was made for TV hmm. than um but I'll let you watch it. Maybe maybe you'll disagree. Yeah, but I, I'm uh, still I was, yeah I, I enjoyed I was, the other ones. I think Kenneth Branagh makes an amazing Hercule Praro you know, I think he brings that character to life very well. So yeah, looking well, forward and, to it. You know, and I loved the old seventies Death on the Nile at uh, Orient Express. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I got I, I think those are, are wonderful. So I was kind of looking forward to this one because it wasn't one that I had seen anyone else do. So I was like, cool. I don't I don't have like the the one that I saw first that I compare it to because that kind of sometimes kind of hurts your uh, opinion of it. Mm-hmm. So I was like, Oh, this is great. Cause this is gonna be the first time I've seen, uh, yeah, I've, I've heard the story or anything. So I have nothing I can compare it to as far as previous versions. So I thought that I would actually really love it more because of that. And instead it was just, it got, just kind of a letdown. Mm. Uh, well, yeah. Sometimes that happens, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. How can you do? Well, what kind of games have you been playing recently? Are you getting to play or are you mostly well you would count as well as the ones that you're running, right? So what are you what are you doing gaming wise? Uh well, gaming wise, so my our, our primary game is uh we we started a traveler campaign uh, a couple months ago and we're actually doing a one of their their long campaigns instead of doing a little short adventures adventure of the week. So we're doing, it's called secrets of the ancients and it is, it's actually the longest um, pre-written campaign I've ever attempted. Uh, it is 10 adventures long and it's done in the, the linear fashion where one adventure will lead to the next that will lead to the next. Uh, and part of what I, I liked, cause I looked through a ton of ton of different campaigns, you know, for different games to kind of find one that really scratched whatever itch it was. And I wasn't expecting it to be traveler. Uh, but the, uh, the, what they did is there was originally a module in the 1980s called secret of the ancient singular. That was like 40 pages long. And this is secrets of the ancients, which, uh, mongoose then did. And it's like 280 pages and they're the full size instead of the digest size. But, the uh, the guy who who did the update was um, uh, Gareth Hanrahan. Yeah, who did some stuff with Delta Green and whatnot. It reads like a Call of Cthulhu adventure. I mean, including your uncle has passed away <laughs> and you have to you know go to the will reading. I mean, it's yeah, it hits all this. But then it Delta it Green and, and the, I think the, he's done Trail of Cthulhu. Yes, so you can feel that in the DNA uh, as far as like. Wow, this is like the most Call of Cthulhu adventure that I have read that has no mythos whatsoever in it, but it hits all those uh, all the notes. And the other thing I like is all ten adventures are uh, have different themes. So like, there's like there's the really heavy espionage one that like we've done like the heavy role play, and right now there there's like a fugitive one. So we're on chapter three currently, and uh, so I am 
I am enjoying the hell out of it. Uh, mostly trying to keep up with my players who of course will do the, just the last thing I could possibly expect them to possibly attempt or think was a good idea. Uh, so, um, but I've, I've been liking it. And like I said, it, it hit all the notes I wanted from a, a Cthulhu campaign, but has no mythos at all. It's just sci-fi. So how about, how about you? Yeah. So I have been fortunate enough to get a lot of gaming in recently, a lot of uh, board games. Uh, I've got some friends here in town uh, and we, uh, we try and get together and do some board gaming uh, fairly often. And and of course I got some uh, role playing game stuff going on. Um, I just purchased for my, uniquely most of the gaming that I do is, is with friends, right? I'm, I'm playing board games with, you know, guys at a game store or something, or, or I'm doing role playing online, you know, with friends, but I don't do a ton of gaming with my family. Well, I just bought a board game explicitly to only play with my family. And that is the brand new, Ticket to Ride Legends of the West. Have you ever played Ticket to Ride? No, I haven't. Ticket to Ride is a, I, I like it a lot. It's a, what they call a gateway game. It's a simple rules, easy to play, but it does have some complex or, or there's a depth to the game where, uh, cause it's not that complex, uh, but there's a depth to the game where it uh, has high replayability. You can go back to it and play it often uh, over and over again and really have a good time. And my family, you know, my wife, my kids, uh, they enjoy it. Well, this brand new version called Legends of the West is also what they call a legacy game, meaning it has a 12-part campaign that you play. And so as you play the game, you will be unlocking new components, new rules, and you're going to be changing the game as you play. Because uh, the box, which is, it's a pretty big, oh, goodness, I have the hiccups. It's a pretty big size box. Inside that box are a bunch of other smaller boxes. And most of them, it says, do not open until instructed. So you have to be playing the game and, and going through it. And then it will instruct you. Now go to box two, open it up, dump out the count, the contents and add them to your game. And the rule book, it has these uh, boxes, these blank boxes that are lettered A through Z, double A through double D and one through 16 on the back cover. And so that's telling me, because the, the rule book also said this in exact words, that you will be finding stickers in some of these boxes, and it will say, here's a new rule, put it in box F. Mm-hmm. And so you'll peel that sticker, open the rule book, and place it into the space that's already been designated and footnoted for you know, rule F, right? When you get it, you put that one in and you are changing the game. There will be oh. times where you take certain components and you you store them in a certain little place where they never come back again. And so you play this campaign all 12 sessions and your personal copy of the game will morph into its final form and it will be a form that is different than your neighbors who have this game and their neighbors who have this game. Everybody who has this game because it will morph and change differently because of the way that you played it. Everyone will have a a different unique game once it's in its final form. And I'm I oh, that is, I'm so excited for this. That is cool. Yeah, I'm so excited for this. I'm so excited to play it with my family because my my kids are now old enough that I think they would you know enjoy the mystery and enjoy unlocking this. And the board is so cool because it's a it's puzzle pieces. 
So the game is starting off on the East Coast. And so all we have, as far as a board is concerned, is uh, from the Great Lakes to Atl- to the Atlantic, from Maine down to Georgia, with a little bit, you know, going west a little bit to get uh, Louisiana. But Florida is not on the map yet. Florida will be in a completely separate expansion. And then everything west of the Mississippi are other expansions. And so eventually, we'll add enough puzzle pieces that you'll have the entire United States. But we're not there yet, you know. So it's going to be so cool. uh, Now, one one game that, so, you know, my, my wife games with me. Yeah, we've got my, my, my buddy George uh, games, but his, you know, his wife isn't a role player. So we uh, we started with the um, the game nights. It's the, the, we started with the Hunt a Killer series where they mail you the box that's got the mystery in yes. it. It's like four boxes long. It's got the, the little props, like, like you find a cuff link and a silk handkerchief. And there's a cuff link and a silk handkerchief in there. And, uh, diff- you know, it's, it, they're props like you would find from the, the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. I mean, those are the high quality things as you you go through. And we did a couple of those, and those are neat. And then we we recently just finished up from a company called Puzzling Pursuits, the the Black Brim trilogy. So that was you know three three adventure boxes. Each one has two parts inside of it of uh, some. You're, you're you're trying to catch almost a Moriarty character in Victorian England, uh, so we just finished that one up, and it doesn't have the same level of props as Hunter Killer, mm-hmm. but you've still got your little things that you get, and just different puzzles you have to solve. So this next month we will be starting uh, the next uh, mystery series uh, from Puzzling Pursuits uh, called La Familia, which I think is a mafia themed thing. So. That, I'm looking forward to that. So that has been our non RPG sort of uh, game night, where we you know, knock back a couple bottles of wine and try to solve a mystery. And that's an absolute, uh, it's an absolute blast. Uh, but our, but we also want to keep the replayability of it. So like we we do not all this. The, sometimes they give you stuff that's supposed to be disposable, and we do not do it. Uh, like we did a hunt a killer recently, where you're supposed to use. Um, like a it was a litmus paper mm-hmm. to to test the three vials to see like the, which one was the chemical and like we bought extra litmus paper just so we could keep the the game you were like the pages that you supposed to write on will like go and scan it and copy it and print off our own and so it's this you know nice. the nerds that cannot absolutely you know, like I can't write in it that would be sacrilegious and then we're done we're like what do we do with it now and uh, so we just give them away to that's nice. other friends you know this uh this ticket to ride legacy game there are other legacy games out there that i i don't own and i have not played yet but my understanding is that in some of these other games they were doing things like this card is no longer needed tear it in half and throw it away and so people were physically destroying components of their games and i think that has kind of had a a bad you know sour taste in some people's uh, mouths for for these games they're like i spent x number of dollars on this i don't want to be tearing stuff up and so thankfully in ticket to ride they're not having you tear anything up they just have a little a little uh divider in the in the card tray where you have all your cards stored and they're like you don't need this one you want this one anymore go put it in the dead letter office and it will just sit behind that divider and never come out again i'm like that i can do and, you know it's not being destroyed but um yeah there's uh I mean, I love I love a lot of board games. I'm, I'm playing board games either as physical versions or also as digital versions. Like quickly, I'll kind of go through a few here. Um, uh, I love the franchise Dune, and so uh, a few years ago, a company called Direwolf Digital pu- uh, published uh, Dune Imperium, a board game and two expansions. I have all of those, and they are fantastic. Well, I think. 
they've wanted to try and, you know, they've been learning lessons from that series of games. And so they recently redesigned and republished what they're calling basically like Dune Imperium 2.0, but it's, it's Dune Imperium Uprising. It's a new core game and, and it's a, a little more sleeker, a little more, you know, few better, uh, components and, um, uh, mechanics in the game. So I just also bought that recently and, uh, that is awesome. Uh, and on steam, I'm playing, uh, fury of Dracula. That's a fantastic game and, uh, terraforming Mars. Um, both of these games I also own as physical copies, but it's a lot easier to play the uh, steam ones, you know, online sometimes. So, uh, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I'm getting a lot of, of board gaming in as well as role playing. I um, said, I've never been a board game. And I, I very, I used to do a lot of video games and I just, the, the time involved is I, I got so many other projects that I work at God that I never seem to have it. I, cause you're bringing up, see, I desperately need to pick up Starfield, uh, which is the giant space exploration one. I'm, I'm clearly on a sci-fi kick currently. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> so I am, I, I keep kind of watching that and say, you know, eventually it's going to happen is I'm going to have about four days where I don't have anything that I'm supposed to be doing. And that's probably when everyone is going to lose me for a month because of I, well, I had four days to play a game and then I took 40. So I am, I am, I'm probably going to have to get that one. Eventually I am going to wait a little bit longer to make sure the bugs get worked out because I learned years ago, uh, wait a few months after any video game releases for the bugs to, work out and that absolutely saved my butt when cyberpunk released because I had waited years for it. Other people asked why I was planning on waiting six months um, right before it released. I was like, yeah, I'm going to wait about six months and then it released and everybody saw what happened. I was like, yep, that's why you wait. Mm -hmm. And you know, I played a a wonderful version. So I'm going to, I'm going to wait because I've heard of the weird and sometimes hilarious bugs that have been popping up in that game. And uh, since I don't get to play video games that much. I would rather play the uh, already patched <laughs> version go. by the time I get to it. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, I haven't. I don't know. There's something. There's a hole in my head for video games, like PC video games and console video games. Like I don't mind uh, Steam, you know, digital versions of board games because they've been designed to use a mouse, like everything is just mouse click, you know? Uh, so it feels intuitive, but there is something in my head. I cannot do the keyboard controls for like, you know, what is the, is it the S A W D or X or oh. what is that? I forgot what that, that is. is. That, yeah. That is yeah, like that. with your left hand, you just do it doesn't work. Doesn't work. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, what? This? What? I have a friend of mine who, you know, he wants to be on the cutting edge of everything uh, digital gaming. So he has uh, a VR setup. And it, like he's in his second gen of VR setup, right? He constantly is upgrading this thing. And he's like, yeah, come over to the house. We'll do some VR gaming. I'm like, all right. So I'm, I'm wearing the headset and I've, I've got the hand controls on my hands and I'm in some sort of game where you're just destroying robots, right? It's basically a zombie game, except the zombies are robots and they're all trying to kill you, right? So the robots are coming out of everywhere and you're supposed to be able to just pick up these guns and just shoot and destroy the robots, in full 360, right? I'm so bad. I'm so (laughs) bad. I'll pick up the guns from the ground. I pick up two guns, two pistols, one in each hand. I raise them up. And then as I try and get into a shooting position to just pull the triggers, I let go and both guns drop to the ground. 
So then I bend over and I pick up both guns and I drop them. I pick them up and I drop them. And I just keep doing that until all the bad robots come up and just start pounding on me. And then I die. And my buddy is sitting off to the side watching all this, you know, on the computer screen, right? He can see what I see. And he's like, why do you keep dropping the guns? And I'm like, you think I'm doing that on purpose? I can't hold on to them. Yeah, I just... <laughs> so so if, unless it's just a mouse, I can't play video games of any sort. Or, or I need to go back in time and just pump quarters into the machine where it's just a joystick and maybe one or two buttons. That I'm That's my speed, right? Oh, God, you got generation gaps there. <laughs> um, I'm not a console gamer. I, I, I've actually always been bad at... I think I swore it off when my friends all got into a racing game kicks and I cannot do racing games. I, or, or flight simulation games. I am, I look like I am intentionally trying to do as bad as humanly possible. Like God purpose. And it's same thing. Like, why are you doing that? Like you think this is on purpose? (laughs) Why would I do this intentionally? I am, I'm clearly an idiot is the problem. So, but how about, how about, how about like some role playing games? Yeah, Man, are you so, doing I mean, I, I've got you know, I've got a lot going on with that too. So you know, of course, we have our our ongoing uh, Miskatonic Valley campaign that I'm doing with our patrons, which is um, I'm just finding uh, scenarios that are set in and around Arkham, right? Arkham and Dunwich and Kingsport, you know, anything kind of in and around the Arkham uh, or the Miskatonic Valley. I'm I'm kind of weaving these all together into a uh, into a a living campaign, right? And uh, our patrons are playing, um, <clears throat> and you know, some patrons are in have been in each one, and some have not. But you know, they're all playing these characters, and it's just been a ton of fun. We record it, we publish it just for the patrons. That's currently on hold though, because. I'm currently running a Call of Cthulhu campaign. Um, it's the A Time for Sacrifice, uh, written by uh, yes. Ben Burns, Brian Cordemanch, and Jonathan Bagelman. And it was uh, it was a you know authorized uh, 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 licensed game by New Comet Games, and uh, and it's you're playing in it. Um, yes. Are you having fun? South American. I, I am having a blast. I, my character is absolutely inequipped for this situation. <laughs> it is a, uh, it's a very weird and different situation, but I feel like it's, uh, uh, it's appropriately Lovecraftian in some ways, right? Um, definitely in his, I, his uh, more sci-fi uh, vein. I, I will say when yeah when when you, when you finally gave us that 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 twist of the inside the pyramid, I did not see that coming at all. Uh, that was yeah. Any silence on my part is true stun silence of like, <laughs> w- wait, w- what? So because like you know, the other stuff like you you know if you've played or read enough uh, Call of Cthulhu scenarios, they're like certain things of like oh, you know, I wonder which monster this is, and you're trying to kind of parse that out because you know you're familiar with all of them, whether you've either played or run them or just kind of read about them. When when that one took its twist, it was it was absolute surprise. Awesome that stuff. I I will never I would never have guessed this is what we're doing. And I am absolutely unequipped for this situation, which I'm playing a lawyer at an archaeological dig. It's not like I've got like a, a <laughs> but you know, I feel like, Hey, he's got some good skills and not now. Uh, so I, I'm enjoying it uh, quite a bit. So that's one of the games I am playing on is uh, time to sacrifice it uh but that that campaign though is uh how many how many adventures is it five say there, there's three, five four, chapters five. Oh. um and what's really cool about the way that this was written is that the five chapters are each a completely standalone scenario and uh but they are all unified in the fact that they're all set in this uh mesoamerican you know central american uh, you know, the Yucatan uh, kind of uh, yeah. 
locale, uh, but they are uh, only a few years apart from each other, right? Um, and so with that in mind, it's a campaign in the fact that it's this locale with some unified elements to it, but it's not um, like a Masks of Nyarlathotep where the same cast of players um, need to be in the entire campaign. So we can have our group of players who are playing chapter one and it will have a satisfying or at least a completed ending to it. Um, and maybe some of those, right now I have no idea how the hell we're supposed to get out of our career. Right. Well, that's good. I'm glad. I'm good. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. Um, and the, uh, uh, but the cast of characters and players here in chapter one, once it's over, then, you know, people can make decisions based on their real life on, Hey, do I have time and availability for another chapter? If you don't, that's awesome. We'll, we'll get other players to come in with new characters. Cause it'll be advanced forward, you know, two or three years in the game period. And it'll be a whole new situation in that same locale. And we just keep going from there. So I think it'll be a really interesting campaign that way. Well, it, it, it's, it's almost like, it's, it's almost like they figured out how to do almost a West marches style campaign setup, but with call of Cthulhu where, you know, this, the, the next one, you might have one or two of the players or maybe they're even their characters doing the next one, but then you have completely new players and, and characters come in, do that one kind of then okay next one and then it might be a different player and character from the first one that missed the second one and you know, it, it kind of just a different cast of, of players and characters i think that's a really cool setup so uh according to theory I, we're mostly done with the first of which was egg out of time then that we egg, said the, yes. the name is? egg out of time is the is the first chapter and uh you know i and I, I'm always apprehensive to say, uh, like, oh, we should it should be one or two adventures left is what they estimate because I've played with the how we roll guys long enough to know that that is the biggest lie on earth. Mm-hmm. It ain't over till it's over. Uh, so it's like I think I think you said like maybe one more. It's like okay, so anywhere between one and twenty more sessions, we will 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 wrap this yeah, up. It's because- point, yeah. <laughs> and and for those who may be interested, we are recording this game, uh, and my plan is to wait until we're completely you know until we complete playing the entire first chapter, and then I'm gonna have some editing done. So try and clean it up a little bit. It'll it'll sound real nice and we're not going to just release this only to our patrons. We're going to release this uh, publicly. Uh, so anybody who is listening to our podcast will be able to download these episodes, hopefully enjoy it. And, uh, and hopefully you'll, you'll want to become a patron because really, even though we're putting this out there, the players are all patrons. So if you want to play in, in one of our games with us, Become a patron and uh, join us. It'll be a lot of fun. And uh, the one of the other games I'm playing in also happens to have the same game master, which is you. Uh, uh, we're <laughs> that is we're we're doing uh, Alien with with how we roll and in classic how we roll fashion. We were supposed to have wrapped this months ago. Oh. <laughs> this, <laughs> months and months. I, ago. I love Joe, but man, it is it is. Uh, it, it is so common. Yeah. <laughs> it takes forever. Uh, so it's just, it's just on brand. Uh, so uh, what, what is that? What's that adventure called that we're doing? Cause you're, it is a Polish scenario. Yeah. Fallout. So Fallout. it is a, an official scenario and it was the first one that they published at the back of a novel. So in conjunction with the, with 20th century Fox and the novels that they're producing, this was a, uh, a short adventure you know, really, it was designed to be a convention-like scenario, um, but it's available in print at the back of a novel, uh, the name of which is escaping me right now. But um, yeah, it's but it's uh, Andrew Andrew Gaska. Yep, he uh, wrote it. Who's written some of the stuff? And I, uh, it's supposed to be a convention-like scenario, which means like you could take any group 
of complete strangers to the game, and in four hours you can introduce them to the game and have a full adventure. How many hours are we in? Um, I think we're solid four at solid least. Solid four. I think six, though. We might be at six. Yeah, sounds sounds about right. Which, hey, who, who knows? Uh, when when I did um, Chariot of the Gods, I think that was supposed to be like a eight hour game, and we 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 clocked it at about twenty. Five twenty six hours. So that's yeah, normal for Alien, as far as I could tell. Yeah. But definitely normal for how we roll. Yeah. And it's I can't even blame them in particular. It is a aura uh, around them where we all play very. We make the worst decisions. So. <laughs> we do. We do. <laughs> but I am getting to play Alien with you, so that's that's fun. Um. And then the the only other one that I'm I'm playing currently is uh, we have a uh, Cyberpunk Red game that we've been doing. Uh, my buddy George has been running us, uh, and we have been loving it. But his schedule had gotten so hectic that we had to put it on hold for an extended time because it was the you know, once his schedule cleared up, somebody else had problems. Mm-hmm. And, you know, by the time that was done, his schedule got busy again, and you know, life and everything else. So we, uh, we have a tentative date in a few weeks where it will be on Saturday. I am running an all day traveler game. Uh, the next day he is running <laughs> all, all day something. And then I think Monday I have something after that. So it's like, uh, we will be, Oh no, it's a uh, Friday right before we start. I am going over to his house because we're going to do that murder mystery in a box game. Nice. So we will be sick of each other by the end of that weekend. Totally. I keep trying to talk about it to like, dude, we could do this as like a sleepover. Like there's no need for us to like go back and forth to each other's houses. Like we'll pull out some sleeping bags on the floor and we'll watch predator and we'll watch like a bunch of like rated R movies. Like we did when we were kids. Like if, if we knew each other when we were kids and he's always like, no, I want to go home. I don't want to go to my best. We'll do it at your house. We'll sleep in bags on the floor and we'll watch Predator. I don't know why I always have to, it has to be Predator, but that's, damn it, that has to be Predator or Commando. I am willing to go with Commando, but those are the only two options. And uh, he keeps saying no, but I think that weekend with three days together, I might be able to convince him. That would to, be hilarious. That would be awesome. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, but that would be hilarious. I've been trying to push this for years. I'm, I'm picturing his wife standing at the top of a stairwell going, you boys need to keep it down down there. We're trying to sleep up here. I say, we'll eat junk food. It'll be awesome. <laughs> and he's like, no. That's too funny. I'm not sleeping on the floor. And not if there's a bed right there. It's like, oh. that's the point. So, yeah. Uh, but I will get to play some more Cyberpunk before the, the, the end of the year, at least. And I am, I am very excited because I really want to get back to my character because I'm shocked he's lived as long as he has. But I'm, I'm very excited to see what he does next. And what whatever George has in store for us, uh, yeah, I'm excited for something too because I, I do have a uh, a biweekly D and D game. It's uh, it's technically we're playing Swords and Wizardry, which is a a zero e you know the the old D and D white box. Uh, this is a retro clone mm-hmm. of that, and uh, and we're just playing in a sandbox uh, game. There was a there was a book published uh, a few years ago called "In the Shadow of Tower Silver Axe" by uh, Jacob Fleming, and it was really it was written for the uh, the RPG Old School Essentials, but really it's it's flexible enough you can you can uh, adapt it to anything. So I've adapted it to Swords of Wizardry, right? And it's a great sandbox. It's a it's a large realm, and there's lots to explore, and it's so open and diverse that game masters can add in their own stuff all the time. Right. So I, I found a, another, you know, self-contained uh, adventure that had like this town that had big mystery and everything in it. I just plugged that one in and it, it's been a blast. And we've been playing uh, this group of, of guys that we've been playing online. We just recently clocked in a year of doing this. So, when we were playing recently, I, was, I brought it up to him. I said, hey, I don't know if you guys are interested in this, but I had this idea about maybe changing games. And I was thinking Coriolis. 
a sci-fi thing from Free League where it's kind of a blend mm-hmm. of Firefly and Dune, you know, and I didn't know what their reaction was going to be. I Because when we play this... That's such a weird mix. It is such a weird mix, of- yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's such a strange game for me. It really feels outside of my comfort zone, but I think that's one of the things that's kind of attracting me to it because it's such a different game for me. Like it feels like it's very much a sister game to traveler, right? Uh, where it's a science fiction game, but there's not, you know, there's not like magic or, or uh monster, you know, horror monsters or anything. Um, and I haven't had a, a fantasy or I haven't had a, an RPG that didn't have a magic system in, I can't tell you how long or monsters that you were, you know, that were either definitely going to kill you or you definitely kill them to take their stuff. Right. Um, and so mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm really intrigued to play Coriolis, but I don't know the universe very well. So I told the guys, I go, if you're interested I've got PDFs of this stuff. I'll share these PDFs. You know, I don't want you guys to feel like you have to take on a financial burden to play this game with me. I've I've got just enough that that we can play with this stuff, and uh, so I'm going to read some of the like the intro adventures. You know, to kind of get your get into that universe and see if I can understand it well enough to get them to, in on to playing and. Uh, I like the character creation process because you not only create your characters, but as a team, you create and design your ship because it it has that Firefly feel where, and also like in Traveler, you've talked about where you can have this ship, right? Where you don't own it, Mm -hmm. you owe money on it. You got, you know, you're doing jobs to help pay for your ship. Same thing in Coriolis. And that also kind of sets up what is the style of gaming are you going to be doing? Are you guys, you know, bounty hunters or are you scouts, you know, that are checking out uh, new locations and okay. you know, whatever you're doing. So, so I'm going to be no, it, learning about this those, and trying to play this for them and run this for them. Those are, those are a good type of uh, sci-fi game. I like it because you can do just about anything. Uh, what, I always say it was like, yes, we have this great game, but in it you are playing you know, military. And that's like literally it. And, or you're, you're playing you know, just scouts or you're playing just traders. And if it, if it does have that kind of setup of like, it's whatever you want it to be. It's just set in this universe, and, but you can, you know, be good guys or soldiers of fortune or bad guys, whatever, whatever it is you want. That's that does allow a lot of versatility. Uh, is it? Does it use the free league um, system, the, the Year Zero it engine? It does. It does, and of course, with a lot of their games, it is a modified version of it. So, unlike in, well, comparing it to Alien, right? In Alien. To be successful at a skill, you just have to have one success, one six in your dice pool. Um, And having multiple sixes will unlock the ability for you to do stunts, right? Uh, In Coriolis, similar, you will roll your pool of dice and you only need one six to be successful. But I believe, if, if I'm remembering right, a single six is just a single or a second six up to two. Those are just like partial successes. Like you did it, but there's a, there's something, there's a cost that came with it. It isn't unless you get three sixes that you've got a, uh, an overwhelming success that, you know, happened and there was so no, no, you know, no, no complications. You know, no complications. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and if you get more than that, you know maybe then there are stunts and stuff. But you know, so there's got that. And but similar to Alien, it has like talents that are you know talents or skills. And uh, and also in Alien, you can uh, there's the stress mechanic, and you can push your yourself. You know, you can push your role by accumulating more stress. And to do that, well. 
in Coriolis, uh, you can still push your roll, but you're doing it through invoking the icons because uh, it has a very uh, robust religious kind of theology kind of aspect to the game. So there's a little bit of, I guess, magic in the system. I said, you are here saying there's no magic. Maybe Look there's a this. little bit of magic, but it's <laughs> like you're, it's like you're invoking your God. So everybody has, cause it's a pantheon of, of gods. And so, uh, you know, everyone, uh, will have a God that they, uh, uh, are kind of aligned with, you know, that you can invoke for that pushing of a skill roll. Uh, there's still some some aspects of the rules that I need to to get more down pat, but uh, by the mere fact that it is using that Year Zero engine, the lion's share of rules I do already understand. I just need to understand the the more nuances that are being applied to Coriolis. Oh, that sounds that sounds cool. I so just running that in the next couple of weeks. Your first, it will probably be early twenty four because I really want to do okay. a deep dive read. Uh, I want to, you know, there's a in depth political intrigue kind of thing because uh, a lot of the game is also, uh, or as far as the rules and stuff are concerned, it's setting up that backdrop of what this universe looks like. You know. Um, really trying to flesh out here's what the what space and society and everything is like so that now you can as the game master convey that forward to your players um, so that they have a you know a a, a clear a clear understanding or as clear as possible of uh, of you know what are what's commonplace what are rights and wrongs and what can you do in this universe so so I got to figure all that out. Oh, well, good luck. Should be fun. I'm hoping it will be. If I can also figure out how, you know, the rhythm of how these uh, uh, pre-written scenarios are set up and kind of get a sense for that, that'll give me more confidence to maybe uh, create my own, you know, kind of sandbox, small level sandbox adventures for them to play in. Because uh, right now I, I wouldn't know how to design something like that. Yeah, it's sometimes it, it takes you know, like, to go through like one or two of the modules just to kind of understand like how is this game supposed to be and how the beats work, and then you can you know, take it over from there. But no, well, well, good luck. It's always a a, a bit scary when you're picking up that completely different thing than you're uh, yeah. usually don't do. But uh, it's it's kind of kind of neat that you're taking your your uh, kind of O D and D clone group and like okay and now we're gonna play a contemporary sci-fi game and yep that's awesome yeah looking forward to it love it oh that was a lot <laughs> but that was fun i like talking about that <laughs> stuff yeah no this i don't know it's yeah, let everybody know what it is john and i are really doing when um right <laughs> before and after recordings <laughs> where it's usually us just bsing like just a couple couple dudes yep just a couple dudes all right, dude, why don't we wrap this up and call it a day? Let's let's call it a day, sir. Well, we cannot do this show alone, and we want to thank our amazing editors, Max Mahaffa and Edwin Nagy, for their hard work and keen skills in making us sound awesome. I also want to thank John Sumro for our badass logo. He's a very talented artist, so please follow him on Facebook and check out his official website, and please consider joining his Patreon account. Links below in the show notes. And finally, we want to thank the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets for generously allowing us to use their song Gluttony as our intro and outro music. So if you're a fan of Lovecraft's writing and the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, you definitely need to check out the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets. Check out their band campsite and their official band site. Links for both will be in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <laughs>